baby on the deals, Nick. Here we go. All right. Uh, this Thursday, we have another uh, speaker coming for our se seminar series on hardware accelerator databases. Uh, this will be Todd Mustak from MapD. He's, he's the uh, CEO and co-founder. So again, this is another database system that uses um, GPUs to accelerate the execution of queries. So we're not quite there yet in, in, in discussing how we execute queries, uh, but sort of we've talked a little bit about doing sequential scans. These systems are essentially doing super parallel sequential scans on data that's been put inside of the GPU. And they can run that on parallel uh, really fast. And of course, the, the downside, as, as, as we know, we've been talking about this already, about how to move data back and forth between the disk and to, to our buffer pool and memory. These guys have another problem. They've got to move the data from memory up on the CPU down to memory in the GPU. Right? So th these, these talks are, just, are describing how they actually want to manage that. Some administrative things is that, uh, reminder, the homework, or sorry, project one is due Wednesday, September 26th. That's next week at midnight. Homework two will go out later today after class. It originally was due the same day as project one, but I bumped that to be the Friday on the 28th, right? Just sort of give you some extra time, okay? And again, everything's, everything's on grade scope. So any questions so far about project one? I know a couple of you have some technical questions on, on Piazza, uh, and we'll sort those things out. Yes? So uh, I have a question on the auto grader. Yes. So I was trying to do the uh, task, uh, the first task. Uh, like so, uh, you know, I submitted like many times and found out that uh, so there were like twelve tests in total. Yes. And I had to actually had to pass pass all the tests for uh, a task like in order to get any point out. So I wonder if that's just you know so like if you, you know, if you fail the first one, you do, it doesn't do the. I think like I, I failed, so I submitted like. Once and I failed, only failed the last one. Yes. And I got zero for the entire thing. Okay. Then I fixed that one and I got like a whole point on the uh, the task. Okay, did you post on Piazza about this? Uh, post on Piazza, we'll fix it. Okay. okay. Any like non technical, like the greater, the, the greater thing doesn't work right. Sort of high level questions. Everyone feels confident they can build their own buffer pool manager, right? Okay. Uh, the last thing I also want to bring up is just a reminder of what I said at, at the beginning of the semester. Uh, I really want you guys to stop me as we go along if you have questions about the material as, as I'm speaking right now. What I don't want is for people to come up in the front and ask me questions about you know, something on slide 20 that occurred 30 minutes ago. Right? And this serves two purposes. One, if you have questions about the material, then somebody else probably does too, so it's better just to stop me and make sure I clarify or speak more clearly about what it is that you're confused about. But also it serves a, uh, you know, as sort of a, a way to make this material better for the next year, because I can always go back and watch the video and see what, you know, the students asked this question, this part wasn't clear, and actually try to make the slides better so that, you know, the thing you were confused about can be described in a better way the next time around. Okay? So it means, again, if you come up at the end of the, at the, end of the class and ask questions about the, something that's not about, like, the homeworks or something, uh, you know, beyond the, the, the course material, I will not answer the question, right? I'm not trying to be an asshole, just like, just, I want you guys to stop me because it's not, you know, I just want to speak here for an hour and a half and just go through all the slides. If you have questions, stop me and we can, we can go over things more, more detail, okay? Again, there's no stupid question. The only stupid question there is, is, is this a stupid question, right? So you can ask me anything, I don't care. All right, so, where we're at now, again, just to ground ourselves in understanding where, where we're going along in the semester, is now we're going to start talking about uh, after we know how to organize our data from, on disk and in memory, now we're going up further up the stack and talking about how we're actually going to have queries execute, uh, execute in our system and read and write data. So for today's lecture, we're sort of talking about how we support them uh, to, to internally maintaining metadata among other things. Um, but sort of broadly, you can think of like, we're at this point here called access methods. And access methods are the, you know, sort of almost like self-describing. They're the methods or the mechanisms inside of our database system that's going to allow queries or threads to access data. Um, and the, the data structures we'll be talking about for the next two weeks can be grouped in sort of two categories. We'll have the hash tables that we talked about today. Um, and then we'll have the order preserving trees that we'll talk about on, uh, on Wednesday this week and then Monday next week. And so 
to understand where these data structures are going to be used and how they're going to help us execute queries, uh, we want to first go over what are some cases or where, where can we actually use them inside of our, our system. So as, as I first already said, we can use these to maintain the internal metadata of, of the database system. And you guys are already doing this for your buffer pool, right? You have to build a, a hash table for the page table to map page IDs to frames in the buffer pool, right? That's what I mean by internal metadata. Um, it can also be used for the core data storage of the system. So we can use either hash table or an order preserving tree to actually organize the underlying uh, pages or, or tuples inside of our pages. So the easiest way to think about this for a hash table, right? I'll, there's some NoSQL systems that are key value stores. Right? These are just hash tables that map keys to, to values. In the case of order preserving trees, like B plus trees, though we'll see some systems like MySQL actually organize all the, the pages and the, and the tables themselves inside of the trees. Right? It's not just sort of like a, a, a sort of separate auxiliary data structure. The, the next thing we can use them for is temporary data structures during query execution. So that means as, as we're executing our query, we can actually build a hash table on the fly based on the, t the, the, query, the data we're reading for our query, do whatever it is that we need to do using that hash table, and then blow it away, throw it away immediately when the query is done. Right? And this actually turns out to be much faster than just having to do sequential scans over and over again. Right? We'll see this case in hash joins, but you can compute aggregations this way. Right, the group by clause, you can think of that just, again, using a, a hash table to group the, the, you know, the diff different categories or clusters together. And the last one is probably what most people think about when they think about hash tables and, and, and order preserving trees, is using them for, for table indexes. And the, the main takeaway I want to get from this is that there's certain trade-offs as we go along that we'll talk about where sometimes the design decisions for certain hash tables or certain order preserving trees will be good for table indexes, but may be bad for internal data structures, right? May, the, may, the way we maybe design our, our hash table to do our page table is not the same way we want to do a hash table to do joins. Because again, they have different trade-offs in terms of performance and the amount of mem memory they have to maintain. So again, we'll see this as we go along throughout the semester. But this is what we're, we're end up building, talking about this week are the building blocks we want to use to solve all these problems. And then we again build on top of this and do more complicated things. So the two major design decisions we're going to have in, in dis when discussing our data structures are the data organization and the concurrency methods. So data organization is essentially just how we're going to lay out the, 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 the physical bits of, our, of the data we're trying to store in our data structure in, in either in memory, in the heap, or in, or in pages, on disk so that we can support efficient access to the, the data that we want. Right? And it's, again, it's, it's, it's how we're going to lay out the data plus the additional metadata we may have to store inside of our data structure to figure out what, what, what we need. The second part is how to allow multiple threads to safely access and modify our data structures at, at runtime. So for this discussion, uh, for this week, and for, for Monday next week, we're actually going to, for the most part, assume that we're only going to have a, a single thread accessing our data structure. But obviously, in, in a modern system, you can have multiple cores and multiple threads running. So you're going to want to have you know, multiple threads access to your data structure at the same time. And now you need to protect its contents, both at a logical level and a physical level, to make sure that one thread doesn't write something that another thread is reading and, get, and it gets corrupted data. So by logical versus physical, what I would mean is the physical data structure would be, again, the underlying bits that are stored inside a data structure, and we don't want to modify something that would cause us to have now a pointer to an invalid memory location. Right? That's what people normally think about when, when, they, when they think about allowing multiple threads to access a, a data structure. Um, and we can, protect, you know, we can protect the data structure using latches. The logical contents, or protecting the logical contents of the data structure, has to do with things like uh, what queries are actually seeing while they're running, while other queries are running at the same time. So this is a more complicated, nuanced topic we'll cover much later on when we talk about transactions. The way to sort of think about this is a, a simple example would be, say I have my query delete an entry in my, in my data structure, my hash table. If I go back and check to see whether that, that key is still there, it better not come back and say it's, it's still there. Right? Physically, it could still be there because maybe the data structure is going to remove it later on with a garbage collection process. But the, 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 the bits are still there, but logically, we don't see it. 
So there's a whole bunch of other mechanisms we're, we're going to need to protect these data structures to make sure this occurs. And we'll cover this actually uh, on Wednesday next week, and we'll see, th see this more in detail when we talk about transactions and concurrent control. So our purpose here for this discussion is really going to be focused on, on the first one here, and we're, the first design decision. And we're just going to assume that we have a single thread accessing our, our data structure. It, it makes things much, much easier. So our focus today is on hash tables. So the, at a high level, a hash table is going to provide you with a associative array interface that is going to map keys to values. Right? For some arbitrary key, we want to map it to a value. If you're familiar with Python, uh, it's, it's the dict data structure, the dictionary data structure, same thing. If you've written Java, it's the Java hash map class. And the same idea, keys to values. So the, the sort of core concept of how this is all going to work is that we're going to have a hash function that we can use to compute some location or offset in, a, in, in this associative array that, will, that can point us to the value that we're looking for, for a given key. So the, the absolute easiest way to implement a hash, hash table is what is called a static hash table. So the, think of this as just a giant array of, of, of slots. And for this, we're going to assume that the values we want to store in our, in our hash table are fixed length. So we know that the, 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 the offset at every location, we know how to jump to it based on you know, whether we want the 10th item or the, the, the 100th item. We know how to do that arithmetic to jump to that memory location. So what will happen is that we'll just have some hash function. And it'll, for the given key we want to look up, the simple hash function could just take the key and the bits and mod it by the number of elements that we have. So we just order these different slots from 0 to n, assuming that we have n, n keys that we want to store. And then now when we want to store something, again, we just hash the key, and then we can dump the value inside of there. Right? Super simple. This is the easiest hash table you could actually build. What are some obvious problems with this? What assumptions did I make? No collisions, but why would there be no collisions? First of all, what is a collision? Right, he said the same key hashes the same, the same offset in, in my array. So why am I assuming that there's no collisions? Because I'm assuming I know exactly the number of keys I want to store, n, right? And I just take every key and just mod by n, and it's going to put me in, in the same location, right? It's sort of a real simple case there, here. The other big assumption is that uh, my values are fixed length. So I know how to jump exactly to my, the location that I want. So that's not a big deal, right? To, to handle uh, arbitrary length keys, all we have to do is sort of have this sort of separate storage location over here. And now our giant array doesn't actually contain values. It contains pointers to some other memory location or some other page location that has the, the values that we want. Right? So again, we, the problems with this approach is that we assume that we know the exact number of keys that we had ahead of time. We also assume that all the keys would be unique, which in many cases uh, it's not going to be. Um, and at this point, we don't have any way to, to, to handle that. Um, and it also assumed that we had what is called a perfect hash function. So a perfect hash function is a theoretical function that, given two keys that don't actually are not equal to each other, the, the hash generated by our perfect hash function will not be equal either. Right? You sort of think of this as, like, if I had my domain of every single possible key I could ever have, I can have a unique hash output or ha hash value for every single key. Again, these exist in literature. In theory, you can just build this with an additional hash table or additional giant, uh, giant, uh, you know, slotted array map. But in practice, nobody actually does this because it's be very expensive to maintain. So the way we want to handle this is by approximating. So the two design decisions we're going to have in our hash hash table. Uh, is what hash function we want to use and what hashing scheme we want to use. And I would say that the combination of these two things is actually what defines a hash table. Right? When you say I have a hash table implementation, it's you have, two, you have these two things. So the hash function, the way you think about this again, is we want to take a large key space 
of every possible key we want to store, and we want to map it to a smaller domain. Right? And the reason why we want to do this is because otherwise we have to have store, either have a perfect hash function or store you know, a, 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 a potential slot for every single key you could ever see. So for this, the big trade-off is, is when we talk about how, what hash function we actually want to use is going to be this, this trade-off between how fast our hash function is and versus what our collision rate is. Because right? again, we're doing this while we're running queries. We're doing this while we're uh, you know, trying to access pages in our page table. We want our hash function to be really fast because we don't want to have to maybe you know, do this huge traversal and long lookup just to figure out where the, the key is that we want in our hash table. So we want to be really fast. But then we don't want to have all our keys mapped to the, the, the same location because as, as I'll see in a second, depending on your hashing scheme, this is going to require you to do essentially a sequential scan to find the thing that you're looking for. So what's the, what's the fastest hash function you could ever possibly build? What's the dumbest fastest hash, hash function? Yes. Exactly. Always, she said always return a number. I'll make it even easier. Always return one. So every single possible key, no matter you know, what name you have in, in, in the directory, what email address, it just always returns one. It's super fast because it's just return one. The problem is the collision rate is, is abysmal because everybody's going to map to one. It's going to map to the same location in, in, our, in our array. So we want to be a bit smarter about this, and that, this is what we can have different hash, hash functions do for us. The next decision we have to make is the hashing scheme. And this is essentially how we're going to handle collisions which are going to be unavoidable because we don't have a perfect hash function, and we're not trying to store a giant array that could, that could handle every possible slot for our keys. So we want to have a, a hashing scheme that describes exactly what method or heuristic we're going to use to handle collisions when, when they occur. And again, for this, the trade-off is going to be almost the classic computer science trade-off, uh, where we're going to sacrifice uh, or give, uh, allow us to use less memory to store a hash table in exchange for having to execute more instructions to deal with collisions when they occur. And again, if I just had a, I could build my hash map that, that's 2 to the 64 possible entries that possibly take all the memory I have in my single machine, uh, I'll never have a collision, so the number of instructions I have to execute to deal with collisions will be, will be minimal, but I've allocated all that, all that memory, and now I can't do anything else in my, in my machine. Right? So again, this is a classic trade-off that we, that we want to handle on. I do not want to get better with Windows. I do not want to update. <laughs> okay? So for today, we're going to start off talking about the different type of hash functions you can possibly have. And this is, you know, this is not an algorithms class. This is not a cryptography class. So we don't really care how it's actually implemented. We're more interested in the, the properties that they have. Uh, and then we'll talk about the two different types of hashing schemes that you can have. You can have static hashing and dynamic hashing. And the extent, just, you know, as a, as a uh, to ground you guys for what we're talking about, the extendable hashing is an example of a dy dynamic hashing scheme. Okay? Okay. So, for a hash function, uh, can anybody give me an example of a hash function they may be familiar with? The one that they may be used in, you know, at an internship or for the projects? Other than STD hash. CRC, yes, that's, that's a good one. SHA-256. SHA-256, perfect example. Okay, so CRC is, is a non-cryptographic hash, right? You can take some arbitrary byte stream, and it'll generate you a, 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 you know, a hash function. He said SHA-256. SHA-256 is a cryptographic hash function. We don't, and it has certain properties that it's not going to leak data, you know, the more keys that you give it, right? And it's very difficult to reverse. We don't care about security on the inside of our system, right? Let me caveat that. For our internal data structures, that the information is never going to be exposed to the outside world, we don't care about cybersecurity or don't care about cryptography inside of this. So SHA-256 is an overkill for what we want. First of all, it's expensive. It's, it's, you know, it's more, more expensive than CRC32, which is a single instruction on, on x86 CPUs. Uh, and it actually can reverse it. If you have the public-private the public -private key, you can take a shot to v6 and reverse it, right? We don't care about reversing it. We just want to know what, what offset do we jump to in our, you know, in, 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 our, in, our, in our table. So we don't want to use a cryptographic hash function. We, have some, we want something that's fast and something that provides us with a low collision rate. So CRC32 is a good example, and we'll see some other ones from Google and some other people that, that are pretty common. 
So the I should actually include CRC32. Um, next year, I'll, I'll include it. But the, so these are some of the most common hash functions that are used in real systems today. I will say the commercial guys and Postgres and MySQL, these are much older systems, so they have their own custom hash function. Uh, but it, most of the data, new database systems that I know about that have come out in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, when I, we talk to the developers, they tell us they're using uh, w one of these guys here. And these are all open source. So Murmur Hash came out in, in 2008. It was originally put out by just some random dude on the internet, posted on GitHub or something, right? And then people sort of picked it up and started using it. Uh, it is designed to be a fast general purpose hash function. Again, these are one-way hash functions where we give them some key, it produces some output, and in theory, if you saw enough of the keys, uh, a key value pairs or keys to hashes, you could reverse it, but we don't care about that, right? We're not, tr we're not worried about leaking any information because this is all internal. So Murmur Hash, again, was designed to be this fast general purpose hash function. Google ended up picking it up in, uh, and actually extending the, the, the version two of Murmur Hash, um, and they designed it to be better or faster for shorter keys, keys that are less than 64 bytes. Right? And they, they wanted to do this because in their, in their internal workload, in their services, this is what the kind of data they saw all the time. And so they wanted a hash function that was optimized for these things. And then Google extended city hash in 2014 with farm hash. Uh, and this was further improved to have better, uh, uh, better, better collision rates. In 2016, they actually came out with another hash function called Highway Hash. This is one that actually does have some cryptographic guarantees, our protections against analysis on the data. Again, so we don't care about that, so we're not going to use that for this. And then the last one here is CL Hash. Uh, so this one's interesting. This one came out of Canada from a professor up in Montreal named Daniel Lemire. Um, and this is actually using a different kind of math called carry less multiplication. Uh, there's a link there for the Wikipedia article if you want to learn more about it. But what was interesting about this is that the idea of, of carry less multiplication is not new. It's just in 2014 or so, Intel and AMD added instructions to do this kind of math uh, in the hardware itself. So now it's actually possible to do this arithmetic very, very fast. And so this hash function became an actual a viable option. So just to give you an idea of what these things sort of look like in terms of performance, uh, so this is, this is an experiment I ran on uh, my workstation which is a, a newer, one of the newer Intel uh, core, core i7 CPUs. So this was written by somebody on GitHub, and I sort of extended it to use CL hash. And so basically what, what, what they're doing is they're going to hash a, a, key, a bunch of random strings of different sizes as fast as possible and measure what the throughput rate is. And so what you see is that when the keys are kind of small, the hash functions are all sort of more, more or less the same. But then as you increase the key size, uh, and the, the, the y-axis is throughput, so, so it's how many... How many bytes of a key can you can you hash as fast as possible? So up to a certain point, they all sort of sort of, sort of plateau, and you can see the SCD hash in there, the black line that you guys are using for your uh, for your for your project. Again, it's it's reasonably good, but the two solitude pattern lines are from the the city hash and farm hash from Google, and as I said, they designed it to be optimized for 64, 64 bytes or less than sixty four bytes. And then the, the, the points where it sort of goes up and goes back down, these are where they're aligned to cache lines. So cache line is when you do a fetch into memory, uh, you just don't get like just the one thing you want. You get a whole bunch of stuff uh, along with it that are nearby because it assumes you're probably going to need that too. And then it can start packing them into 64 byte cache lines. So now if you can do a bunch of uh, operations or instructions on data that's sitting in, within a single cache line, you never have to go back and, and fetch more to maybe the upper levels of your cache. So that's why you see this, like when it gets to 32 bytes or 64 bytes, it's, uh, you know, you're getting much better performance because it's, it's for one cache miss, they're doing uh, uh, more work. As, as, for one cache miss, you're, you're, doing, you're generating more output for the same amount of read, data read. Right? So that's why there, there's the sawtooth pattern. And just to throw a CL hash in this, again, you see the same, uh, the same kind of uh, ups and downs based on uh, how you're actually packing things into registers. Um, the main takeaway I want to give you, for you guys for this is like for things that are less than 64 bytes, you can use city hash or farm hash. For larger strings, you maybe want to use something else. For our project purposes, we're not trying to run as fast as possible. Uh, 
you know, because we're running, you know, running in SQLite or in Gradescope. So this SCD hash is good enough. So the main takeaway here is that different hash functions have different properties, and you may want to choose one versus another based on what you think the distribution of the data it is and what you're actually trying to do with it. But the hash functions are, as far as I know, interchangeable with all the hashing schemes that we'll talk about next. So when we talk about these hashing schemes, it doesn't matter whether you're using city hash or murmur hash, the actual algorithm will still work the same. It's just, the question is whether you're going to have a higher collision rate uh, with one function versus another. Again, and that can depend on the distribution of your data. Okay, so now we're going to talk about static hashing schemes. So again, the hashing scheme is the, the protocol or the method that the, that the hash table is going to use when there's a collision. And we said collisions are, are essentially unavoidable because we're trying to store a large key space into a small, smaller amount of memory. So things may end up hashing to the, the, same, the same key. So first I'll talk about, talk about linear probing hashing, uh, Robin Hood hashing, and cuckoo hashing. So linear, linear probe hashing is the, probably the most common hash table. Uh, it's not the one everyone thinks of uh, when you think of a hash table. Most people think of the, the chain hash table, which we'll see in a second. But in terms of implementation inside of database systems, this is the one that's, that's the most common because it's just so simple and so fast. So the hash table is just going to be this giant table of slots. And you take the key you want to insert, you hash it, and that, that puts you into some position into, into the, the hash table. Right? And so what will happen is if two keys hash to the same slot in our table, then the, the, we just keep scanning down into our table until we find a position that is free, and that's where we can go put our item in there, the, the thing that we're trying to insert. Right? And this is why it's called linear probing, because, again, we're, we're just going linearly, almost as a sequential scan in the table, going down until we find the thing that, that we're looking for. So for lookups, we have to, again, we do our hash from a key, we land in some space, we scan down until we find the thing that we're looking for. Or we find an empty spot, at which point we know that we've, you know, the thing we're looking for is not there. Of course, now what's the problem with, with this, with this approach? Yes? He says, uh, he says uh, yes, he's correct. He said that when you do a deletion, uh, you now make an empty spot, which sort of disconnects the two, the two chunks of the things next to each other. Yes, absolutely. What's another problem? Say I'm doing an insert. The thing I want is not there, and I keep scanning. What if I never stop? Right? What if I reach the bottom, loop back around, uh, and keep scanning down, and now I land back in the, the original position I started at? I'm stuck in an infinite loop. Right? So we also need, when we, when we do inserts we also need, and, and, and searches, we want to keep track of where we left off so that we don't loop forever. So let's, let's look at an example. All right, so say um, on, the, on the side here, A, B, C, D, E, F, these are the keys I went to insert. And again, my hash table is just this, this giant array of slots. So I want to say, and first, first thing I want to do is insert A. So I take A, I hash it, and it lands at this position here. right? Because nobody's there, I can go ahead and take, take, the, take the slot. So inside of the, the entry in my hash table, I need to store the key that I, 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 that I, that I just inserted, the original key, as well as the value. Right? Again, the value could be, uh, could be like a, a, a record ID, like a page ID and an offset. could be an actual value. Right? It, you know, it, it doesn't matter, but I, I need to store both. And the reason is because when I come back and, and try to insert something else or do another lookup, the hash function is just going to tell me where to jump into the hash table. But then, then I need to still do a comparison as I'm scanning to see whether the entry I'm looking at is the actual key that I want. Because again, two keys may hash to the same location. I need to know whether you know the the entry is actually the key, the same key as me. All right. So now let's say we hash B. That points up here. Nobody's in there, so that's fine. So now we want to hash C. C points to the same slot that A is in, but that's occupied. So again, the linear probe method just says go down to the next one, um, and that's where we put C. So now if I do a lookup on C, when I hash it, I'll land where A is. I do my comparison with the key in A and the key, the key of C. They're not equal. Keep scanning down. Then I find my match on C. 
right? I can do this through the so forth and so forth. D goes where C is. That's occupied, so it has to go to one below. E goes where A is. That's occupied, so it has to go all the way down until it finds a slot that it's taken. And then last one for F, right? So I'm going to, uh, uh, he brought up a good point about deletions here. We are going to punt to make this easy and just not deal with deletions. So for, ha for certain operations, this is fine. For a hash join or aggregations, this is fine because you're not going to go back and delete the entry as you're doing your hash join. So just, I, I realize you might not know what a hash join is, but the basic idea is I want to join two tables. I build a hash table for one side, put the keys in there, and then on the other, on the other table, I do a probe in the hash table and see whether I have a match. Right? So the, 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 the hash table is read-only. Same thing for aggregations. I never go back and delete something. So in that case, this is fine, and this is super fast. For deletions, exactly as he said, you have to do some reshuffling and copy things around to fill in the gaps, and that becomes expensive. So this is another example of a trade-off where this would be great for some operations where insert only and read heavy, but if you want to do updates or deletions, you don't want to actually use this uh, a linear, linear probing hashing method. The other big issue that we have to talk about is how we actually handle non-unique keys. So for this, I've assumed that all our keys are, are unique, but that's not always the case. So there's two approaches you can do to handle non-unique keys. So the first is that you just maintain the values of the, for the duplicate key in a sort of separate linked list area. So let's say that I have my hash table, I have keys X, Y, Z, A, B, C. These, instead of having the values embedded inside the hash table itself, they just have pointer to some pages or some memory location in the heap, but now just a list of those values. So now when I want to say, give me all the values for X, Y, Z, I do my, do my hash, I jump to my location in my hash table. I may have to scan down, depends on where it actually is. And then I, when I find the entry that I want, now I have a pointer to this other area. And then I know that the, the, the elements or the values in that area only correspond to the key that was pointing to it. The other approach is to just restore the, store the redundant keys and the values together. So instead of breaking it up X, 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 Y, Z, A, B, C, and their values separately, in my hash table, I just store X, Y, Z, and the values together like that. So what are some downsides of the top approach? Is it more space efficient? No, because you know, I'm not just me allocating single entries for every value. I'm going to organize things usually in pages. And so if a, if a single key has one value, I may be storing, you know, have to allocate an entire page to store that one value. Where in the bottom approach, I don't have to do that because I just add another entry into, into my hash table. The downside, of course, again, the top one is more efficient when I want to say, give me, all the key, give me all the values for a single key. I just jump to my one key, then you know, find my key, and then jump to the, the value list, and everything's already there. In the bottom approach, I just have to scan through. So this is another good example of trade-off in, in databases where do we want to favor the reads versus the writes? Right? The top one is, is, is more efficient for, 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 for reads, uh, but maybe less efficient for writes because we have to allocate this extra space. The bottom one is super efficient for, for, for writes because we just plop our new thing in there and not have to allocate any space. But reads may be more expensive because you have to scan through to find it. So that's how you handle non-unique keys. For our purposes going forward, uh, for all my examples in these hash tables, we'll just assume the keys are unique. But, you, but if you need to handle non-unique keys, you have to do something, either one of these two methods. And I would say most people do the, do the bottom one. I actually don't know anybody that does the top one. OK, so we said that one of the big issues with the linear probing hashing method, the hashing scheme, is that we have all of these wasteful comparisons, potentially, when we have collisions. Right? Again, we can try to pick a really good hash function to reduce the number of collisions that we have. But in, you know, in real data sets, it's going to be unavoidable. So the issue is, again, when we have a collision, we have to scan through linearly and, and start looking at you know, every entry to find the thing that we want. Worst case scenario is that the, the, the key that we want is the, the previous key in our, in our hash table. So we land at one position and then have to scan through the entire thing, loop back around, then get to the very end and just find the thing that we're looking for. And in that, in that case, you know, the, the, the hash table is essentially useless to us because we, we could have just done a sequential scan on the data. 
and try to find that thing we were looking for. But now we're paying this, this penalty or this cost overhead of maintaining this hash table and building it and didn't actually help us in any way. Right? What should have been an O1 lookup is now an ON lookup in the worst case scenario. So again, I said the, the way we can try to avoid the number of collisions is just by allocating more memory. Uh, the theory works out, the math works out that on practice, uh, if you want to reduce you know, the, sort of the best on average reduction of, of collisions, would be allocating a hash table that's two times the amount of, of, of keys you actually want to store. But it's still not going to help our case where, uh, well, yeah, this reduces the collisions and reduces the amount of work we have, but maybe there's other approaches we could apply to actually reduce the number of amount of scans we have to do or, or lookups we have to do to find the keys that we're looking for. So the, the, the two approaches to do this are Robinhood hashing and cuckoo hashing. So Robinhood hashing is a variant of the linear probing scheme where instead of a, when we do an insert, instead of just finding the first free slot that comes after the, the, you know, where we should be in the, in, the, in the hash table, we will actually allow new keys that are being inserted to steal the slot of existing keys if they are uh, richer, in quotes, than we are. Right, so Robin Hood is the you know the the, the folklore, the, the tale of you know medieval England. Robin Hood would steal from the rich people and give it to the poor people. So the idea of our hash table here is we want to have poor keys steal from the rich keys. And I'm defining rich in terms of how many positions or jumps they are from where where they actually should be in their optimal position in the hash table. So when we do an insert, if if, if we can't get to our position where we want to be, if as we start scanning down, if we come across a key that is closer to where they want to be in terms of their optimal position to where we should be, then we'll, we'll go ahead and steal their slot and then move them down to a, to a worse position. So let's go back to our table we had before. Again, keys we want to insert is A, B, C, D, e, F. And we said that A, when we hash it, it gets inserted here. And now you can see in our, in our hash table, in addition to the original key and the value, I'm also going to store this this position that says that again the number of jumps we are from our optimal first position. So in this case here, when we inserted A, nobody else was in A slot, so A got to take it. So A's position or the, its 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 distance from its, its optimal position is zero because it's zero jumps from where it should be because it's exactly where it should be. Same thing for B. B hashed up here. Its 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 uh, position counter is zero. So now we want to insert C. C wants to go where A is. So now we want to do a comparison to say what's A's optimal position counter versus our optimal position counter. Now at this point, C it hasn't gone anywhere, right? We immediately hashed this slot here. So our position counter is zero. A's position counter is zero. So we leave A alone. And we just do what we did before in later probing the, the, the original version and just jump down to the next one. But now you see that for cases C, we made its uh, optimal position counter be one because we're one jump away from where we want to be, which is where A is. So now we want to do a uh, do an insert on D. D goes where C wants to be. D's uh, position counter is 0. C's position counter is 1. 1 is greater than 0. So D's not, not allowed to steal from C. And D has to get moved down here. Now we can see this, this, this stealing thing actually work when we try to insert E. So E wants to go where A is, but they're both uh, zero at that point, so E doesn't steal from A. Uh, then we go down here to where C is. C's position is one. E's position counter is one, so, that, so it leaves C alone. But now we go to D. So now E is two hops away from where it wants to be. E D is one hop away. Two is greater than one, so E is allowed to steal from E. E, D, e is allowed to steal from D. Steals its slot, kills it, and then moves it down to the, the next position here. And now D's counter is 2. Right? Same thing with F. One more time. F wants to go where D is. 2 is greater than, than 0, so F can't go there. So F goes down, to, down below. Right? So this is, this is, again, this is a... What we're trying to do here, or what this is supposed to do better than the than linear probing hashing scheme, is that on average... The, the amount of, of scanning you have to do to find the key that you're looking for is, is reduced. 
right? Sort of because right, we're, we're, we're sort of shuffling things around to minimize the number of hops any one key could actually ever be. So my example before where I said it was, you know, the worst case scenario would be the, the, the key that I'm looking for this is actually one above where I hash to. That can't occur under this scheme because before you got there, things would get swapped around. Right, because there's likely to be one that's actually worse than, than you. So this is, a, this is an old technique. This is from like 1985, and it's one of those things where like the paper came out in 1985, no one actually read it, and then or you know, paid, paid attention to it in sort of the systems community. And then in the last 10 years, it sort of showed up on Hacker News a couple times, and some systems are actually implementing this. The in practice, what I'll say though is that the 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 research shows that this actually does not this is not better than linear probing. It seems like it would be, but it's not. Because on modern CPUs, all this sort of these, these checking these, these, these counters and moving things if necessary, this is doing additional branch misprediction, which is slower on superscalar architectures, because right? you have to flush your, your, your pipeline cache, your pipeline, and, and load everything back in. And it's also extra copying. So for, for a single insert, I may have to copy one thing out and, and move it to the next one. I don't do that under linear probing because I just keep scanning until I find the thing that I want. And the scanning is actually cheap. Yes? Uh, when E is stealing the slot from E, does this uh, algorithm ensure that uh, E is not going to be worse than E? So your question is, back here, when we were, we were inserting D, uh, E, your question is, at this point here, when we want to steal from, from, from D, we're saying that your question is, does this ensure that D is no, not going to be worse than E, or E is not going to be worse than D? Um, the weighting is not going to be worse than the one Yes, correct. So his, his statement is, in this case here, when we're stealing, the idea of stealing is that we're going to make it so that the, the, the victim, the th person we're stealing from, uh, it's, no, it's going to be to have the same number of steps, but it's not going to be worse. And we're defining worse in, the, again, the number of jumps you are from where you should be. So in this case here, E was 2, D got moved down, and then D was going to be 2 as well. So it's not going to be the scenario where, where D would be 3, right? Actually, it could be, actually, because if the one below this was 2, then D would keep going down. But then at some point, it would it, it'd find somebody it could steal from. So there's no guarantee that actually stealing would actually not make you worse than the one you that stole from you. So the way to think about this in this sort of human metaphor would be, if so, I could steal from a rich person, take all their money, and now they're more poor than I am, right? That can happen under this. Yes? So I don't see this, how this will, uh, will make this better. So like if the D and E are on the same spot, and you are trying to move them down, either of them down to a to the next empty slot. slot. So you're going to take the, these, time, uh, these steps uh, no matter what. So you are either adding to D or to E, but the total number of steps is still going to be the same. Right, so his statement is that, like, in my, in my example here, the total amount of steps is, is, is essentially still the same for everyone, right? Uh, the, in this example here, the, the, my hash table is tightly packed, right? In a real hash table, if you allocate it enough size, uh, large enough, then the likelihood that there'll be an empty slot so that you're not sort of just keep cascading down and, and still ending up in an you know, even worse position is, is unlikely. It's not always the case. The other thing I'll say too is like on average, this makes the, the, the number of steps per key uh, minimal. Yes, but like the total number of steps is the same. So you can only say that you are avoiding the worst case. Exactly, so you're yeah, absolutely right. So this is trying to avoid the worst case scenario where the, I have to scan through the entire thing. Yeah. That's all the scheme does. But like you are just like trade off the, like the good ones yes. to prove the worst cases. Right, so his statement is, and I agree with it, is that this is a trade off between the guys that are in the optimal position potentially versus ones that actually be, be you know, really bad. Yes, absolutely right. So again, the, the literature says that although this seems kind of like, you know, a neat, nifty idea, this actually is worse than linear probing because you're not going to always get to get the huge benefit that, that you know, you're minimizing everyone's number of jumps or steps you have to take. And we have to do more work in order to reshuffle things. So in under linear probing, I just scan through until I find my, my slot that's free and just put it in there. 
right? Under this, I have to do the, the, you know, the, the copying of the new one in and the copying of the old one out and moving it down. Right, so that means cache misses, uh, branch miss predictions on the CPU, uh, and, and, and other, other issues like that. All right, good. So another alternative to handling these collisions is to do what's called cuckoo hashing. So with cuckoo hashing, uh, the idea is that we're going to maintain actually multiple hash tables at the same time and use multiple hash functions to hash keys to the different hash tables. And the idea is that a key can only exist in either either one of the two, one of the hash tables, right? So for simplicity, we'll say, say there's just two, but you could have more than two. And when we want to do an insert, we hash the key twice, find a free slot in either one, and, and pick that free slot. When we want to do a lookup, again, we hash our key, and we, we check both, both of the hash tables. Now, the issue is how we're going to handle collisions. We're going to sort of ping pong back and forth between the two hash tables, because if we have a collision as we want to insert something and that slot is taken, we'll steal from the, whoever's in there now and then move them to the next hash table. Right? The idea here is, again, we don't, it's, it's to, to, to minimize the number of, um, the amount of work we have to do to do a lookup, but we're going to pay a penalty by having more expensive insertions. So let's see an example like this. So this again, for simplicity, say we have two hash functions. In practice, everyone pretty much always does two. Uh, I have since heard of some people use three, but no one does more than three, right? Just the overhead is, is unnecessary. So let's say I want to insert A. Uh, again, I'm going to have two hash functions, one for each hash table. So when, I ins when it comes along, I hash both of them, and it's going to point to these two locations here. And at this point, both hash tables are empty. So I could go in either one position, but so I'll just flip a coin and tell me to go to, into the, to the first one. Now I want to hash B or insert B. Same thing, I'll hash it twice. The first hash function points to where A was inserted in the first hash table. And that's occupied, so we don't want to steal it because in the, hash, the second hash table, it's an empty slot. So we'll always choose the empty slot and put, put B in there. So now let's say we want to insert C, we hash that twice, it points to where A is and it points to where B is in the two hash tables. So now we need to make a decision which one we actually want to steal from. And in, in practice, it's just random. Right? You can be a bit more sophisticated and maybe assume, may, maybe compute some metadata about the collision rate on one hash table versus another, but as far as I know, nobody actually does this. It's just not worth the engineering overhead. So we'll flip a coin and decide that we want to steal from the second hash table so we'll steal B, B's slot, put in C there, and now we need to take B and put it in the other hash table. So now we'll use the first hash function that corresponds to hash table one. We hash that, but as we saw in the beginning, it wanted to go where A is now. Right? Remember we inserted B, it hashed where A is and turned an empty slot in the second hash table, so we chose the empty slot. Now we want to put B back on the other side. Now we have that collision again, because now we're going back where A is. So here again, we steal from A, put B there, hash A with the second hash function, and then that puts us into the second side here. Right? So these two hash functions essentially can be the same thing. It can be murmur hash, it can be city hash. We just provide it with a different random seed so that they have di different distribution properties. But it doesn't have to, when I say different hash, function hash, fun hash function one, hash function two, it can be the same algorithm. It can just be a different seed value to give it different randomness. Right? And of course, what's the issue with this for, for doing these insertions and moving things back and forth? Infinite loop, exactly right. So we have to maintain some metadata to say, where did we start off when we first inserted? So that if we, if we come back around and we see the same key, trying to put it back in the same spot, we know we're stuck in an infinite loop. And at that point, we have to rebuild the entire hash table. So again, typically, we didn't talk about rebuilding so much for the other two, but typically what you do is when you recognize that my collision rate is too high, uh, and I, I'm stuck in all these infinite loops, you double the size of the, of the hash table. So you, you would do the same thing here. If my hash table is too big, for, actually for both of them, because it, so it's too small, I have too many collisions, I'll allocate a new hash table, double, that's double the size, and then take all the keys that's in, uh, that are in the first one and put it back in, into the second one. Right? And you have to essentially lock the hash table or put a latch on it while you do this to prevent anybody from reading and writing it, because you're, you're essentially just rebuilding the entire thing from scratch. So the math works out that uh, with two hash tables and two hash functions, that you probably, 
won't have to rebuild the tree, or sorry, rebuild the hash table until you're out 50% full. Meaning the likelihood that you're going to hit a key that'll get stuck in an infinite loop won't really happen until you're about 50% full. If you have three hash functions with three hash tables, the math works out that you probably don't need, need to rebuild it until you're 90% full. And of course, now this means again you're, you're allocating a third hash table, so you're paying the penalty of extra memory uh, for having to execute fewer instructions. So, Cuckoo hashing shows up in a couple different systems. I know IBM DB2 does this for their in memory accelerator. Uh, this one actually is, is pretty common. Um, the best open source implementation of the Cuckoo hash table is actually from CMU, from Dave Anderson. So, if you Google like libcuckoo, you'll find the, the CMU version of it. Uh, it was written by Dave Anderson and his students. Um, with Robinhood hashing, uh, I only know one system that does this. Uh, when we asked them why did they do this, they said that the engineers saw it on Hacker News, thought it was a good idea, so they, they implemented it. Um, but the literature pretty much shows that for all these approaches, the linear probing is always, always the best, is always going to be the fastest, so, especially for hash joins. Okay, so this is, as again, these were static hashing schemes, right? That means we knew what the, the number of keys you want to store ahead of time. And so you may be asking, well, what are, you know, when does this occur, right? When would actually, when, 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 when is it possible that I would actually know the number of keys that I have? In your page table, you don't, right? Because the, the, the database can always keep growing, you add new pages, so you don't know the number of keys you need to store. Uh, the, actually, that's not true, and we'll come back to that. Um, the page table is static because your, your bufferable size is static, so it's always a fixed number of pages. It's the directory that grows. Um, so again, a really common scenario is again for hash joins. So say I have a simple query here. I don't have two filters. Uh, I have only filters on these tables, so I know I'm going to read or do a join on, on exactly the number of tuples that I have in both of these two tables, right? So in this case, I know exactly the size of my hash table because I know the number of keys I need to examine. So I can use linear probing, I can use cuckoo hashing, or I can use uh, the, the Robin Hood approach, right? If we, we get too big, then we have to sort of Stop the world and re, you know, double the size and rebuild it, right? And we'll see this later on when we start doing estimations of, of the the cardinality or selectivity of predicates in our query plan. We get this wrong all the time, and that's going to make it really expensive for us if we re have to resize our hash table. In the case of what you guys are writing for the buffer pool, the in-memory page table is always going to be uh, fixed size because you you have a fixed amount of memory, but the page directory can always be increasing in size. So you may not want to use one of these, these methods we're, we've, we've been talking about because you may have to resize it as you go along. So this is where a dynamic hash table is going to help us. So the basic idea is that we're going to be able to grow our hash table incrementally uh, based on whether the number of entries get, you know, goes up or down without having to stop the world and rebuild everything. So there actually should be three approaches. We're going to look at chain hashing, extendable hashing, and linear hashing. All right. So Chain hashing is what pretty much everyone thinks of when, they, when you think of a hash table, right? This is what you get when you, when you create a, uh, uh, you know, use the hash map class in Java and the JDK. Right? This is the underlying data structure that, that they use. So we're just going to have a, uh, we'll have a, a slot array that's going to maintain uh, the, these pointers for every single key to, uh, to this, this, the head of a linked list of buckets. And we're just going to store all the values we have in, in, in these buckets. And the way we're going to handle collisions is that we're just going to scan along linearly inside the bucket until we find either the thing that we want, uh, if we're trying to do a lookup, or we find a free slot that allows us to insert something, right? So again, it looks like this. Again, we have our, our slot array that's going to point to uh, these linked lists. Uh, if there's nothing been, if nothing is hashed to a particular position in our slot array, then we just store null, right? There's no reason to, to point to allocate memory that we don't need yet. And then we have our buckets, and the buckets, again, are just going to be the same entries that we had in the linear probing hashing method where we have to store the key and, and, and the original the key and the value. And let's say that we want to do an insert into this, this first bucket at the top, and it's, too, and it's full as we follow along the linked list. Then we, all we have to do is just allocate a, a new bucket and extend out our, 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 our bucket chain or linked list like that. Right? Now we sort of see the same kind of issues we have with linear probing. If everything hashes to the same bucket, 
then I'm essentially going to have to do a, a, a sequential scan or linear scan across every single element in the bucket list to find or the thing I'm looking for, or find the, you know, a free slot to put something in, right? So it's sort of unavoidable. If you if you have a lot of collisions, then you end you end up sort of degenerating into a, a sequential scan. The uh, right. So these these bucket lists can can grow infinitely, and that becomes problematic. Um, in terms of how you actually implement this to be thread safe, it's actually really easy because you just have to take a latch on the actual bucket itself, right? You can, the easiest thing to do is, is to take a latch on the entire hash table or you just take a latch on the slot inside of the, the slot array with the pointers, but even you need more fine grain uh, uh, latching would be take this latch on the individual pages and you know nobody's gonna modify it as, as you're scanning it. So. Again, the downside of this approach is that these, these buckets grow infinitely and it's, re -hard, it's hard to sort of shuffle things around because I essentially would have to rehash everything or just rebuild the entire hash table. So a more incremental approach is what you guys are building in your, for, for your first project is called extendable hashing. Again, these are, this is an old idea. It's from like 1982, 83, um, but it's, it's, it's widely used in a bunch of different systems. Um, the, it's basically an extension of the chain hashing approach uh, but instead of letting the, the linked list of the buckets grow forever, we're gonna we're gonna split them and and move elements around. And the idea here is that rather than again rebuilding everything from scratch, we want to do this incrementally so that the impact of having to do a split is not a large you know major stall in in our thread that's executing. All right, again, rebuilding the entire hash table is expensive. We have to take a latch the entire thing. No one can read and write from it, and I have to you know copy everything in one hash table and put it into another one. The idea of extendable hashing is that we can do this a little by little cooperatively to sort of smooth out the, the access time across all threads. So let's look at an example. So we're going to have our slot array. Uh, and again, these are just going to be, be pointers to our, our, our bucket list. And then but we're going to have these different counters that, that's going to keep track of the, the, the depth, the number of bits we have to look at to figure out what bucket we should be going to. So we're going to have the global depth that says the, uh, the maximum number of bits we have to examine across all, all of our slots. And then for each bucket, they're going to have a local depth that says the number of bits we need to, that you would need to get, get here, or that we're actually representing. So for the, the local depths, we don't actually need these to figure out where we need to go. The global depth we do, we do need, but the local depths are essentially metadata for us to keep track of you know who's pointing who's potentially pointing to us right so that we can reverse this all right so the first thing we see that now in our in our in our slot array we have the values we have the output of our, of our hash hash functions the hash values and for this purpose here the global depth is 2 so i only care about the first two bits of of the hash value so in my example here i'm going from left to right i think the textbook goes left to right some other examples go right to left. It doesn't actually matter. The algorithm is still the same, whether you go from least significant or most significant bit. It's, it, everything's still the same. So let's say I want to do a find on A. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the value A, or the key A, and I'm going to hash it, and I'm going to produce some, some bit sequence like that. And then I look at my global death and says, I need to examine the first two bits of the, the, the value of the hash function to figure out where I need to go to find the element that I'm looking for, or find, find the bucket that I want. So in this case here, I need to look at the first two bits, which is 0, 1. So that tells me I want that entry in, the, in my slot array, and it's going to point to the, the, this bucket here at the top. And then I just do a sequential scan in that, and I find the thing that I'm looking for. So this is a good example of the difference between the global depth and the local depth. The global depth is 2, which means I always have to look at two bits. But as we see, 0, 0, and 0, 1 both map to the same bucket that has a local depth of 1. So that means that to get, to get here, the way what happened was I only had to look at the first bit, which was 0, and that's why they get mapped to the same, the same location here. Right? Again, global depth used for the lookup. The local depth just keeps track of what you, what you had to do to get there. So now I want to do, say, uh, an insert on B. Same thing, I look at the global depth, the global depth is two, so when I hash it, I just wanna look at the first two bits of the hash value. That points me to one zero here, and that points to uh, the second bucket, 
and there's a, there was a free slot, so I can go ahead and, and add my entry, right? That's fine. Now let's say I want to do another insert on C. Uh, and again, global depth is two. I look at the, the first two bits. That tells me to look at here. But now it's pointing to the second bucket, but there's no more free slots. So this bucket is full. Under chain hashing, I would just have a new bucket and extend out the linked list. But on our extendable hashing, I'm actually going to split this uh, and, and, and rehash it so that some of the elements in the bucket went to, to, the, to the new new bucket and some of the elements stayed in the old bucket. So what happened here, just go back it again, right? I'm going to change the, uh, the global depth to three, extend out my, my hash array. And for this bucket, the global depth was now three. And that's good, updated like that. And so I'm going to look now at, for all these elements, I'm going to look at the first three bits. And then I use that to figure out in my hash table where they belong to. So I should have maybe drawn this in more, in more steps. So back here, I say, oh, I need to split. I'm too big. So now I look at my global depth is two. Uh, <coughs> sorry, my, my local depth is two. So that says now I need to go to three. And so now I'm going to look for each key in here. I'm going to look at the first three bits. And when I extend out my slot array, that'll tell me whether I stay in the original bucket or I go to the new one. With now the local depth is three as well. And the global depth gets updated to three because that's the, the largest number of, of um, the local depth we've seen so far. So now I haven't, still haven't inserted C yet, right? Because I just did my split because I couldn't insert it where I wanted. So now when I go and do insert C, now I look at three bits, and then that points me to this bucket here and tells me where I need to go. I'm seeing blank faces. Is this clear? Right? It's not, it's not that tricky, right? Yes? His question is, when I find a bucket, do I still have to do a sequential scan to find a free slot in it? Yes. Right? This is just some block of memory, and I, I know where my the starting point is, and I just have to scan to find the slot that I'm looking for. And, and I know what my boundary is of, of the bucket, so if I go beyond that, then I need to split. Okay, so the local depth is actually just for like, um, extending, but not much use when you're like, trying to... Correct. So his statement is, the local depth is just for extending. It's not actually used to find what you're looking for. Right? So once you're inside the bucket, you don't care the number of bits that you use to get there. You just actually do the same checking that you would do in all the other cases. It's when you split to say, all right, I originally was two, now I'm three, so anything that's inside of me, now I need to figure out where that actually needs to go. And I can stay in the bucket that I was originally, or it can go into the, the new bucket I just generated. But yeah. The statement is essentially you have to still have to rebuild everything. Rebuild everything inside the bucket or in, in, in the entire hash table? No. So it's, his question is, do I still have to rebuild everything in the hash table? No. The, the change is localized to just the bucket that, that overflowed. Uh, right, so all of these, like all these other ones here, this guy here and this guy here at the bottom, they stay the same. And actually now when I go, and I'm extending my slot array, now I'm looking at three bits, I see that the, the first two guys, they were still pointing to the first bucket, they still do. And then now these guys over here, are still now pointing to this one as well. Again, if I'm just looking at bit one, zero, zero for these two guys is in the first bit, zero, zero for these two guys in the first bit, they're all still still pointing to the same bucket with a local depth of one. Yes? So after you split this, uh, I think the global one will have... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I have to click, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so, yes, you are increasing the size, the size of the slot array. Yeah. Like, you have to double the size of that. Yeah. But, like, that's not, that's not the big part. The big part is all of this crap in here, right? Because, again, I'm storing keys and values. If I have to reshuffle this, that's expensive. Uh -huh. Extending that is easy. So, you, actually, you, you rebuild actually means something very specific in a hash table. It means, like, literally rebuilding a brand new hash table. This is just a small change internally to, to the, the internal metadata, which is cheap, right? Because I can all, like, like again, this, these are all going to be 64-bit pointers, and it's going to be some small array, right? 
I can create the new one, copy everything over, and do a compare and swap to put the new one and install it in there, right? That's way cheaper than hashing and reshuffling everything. Yeah. So his question is, what would happen if for, for this first bucket, if I inserted maybe two more things and it, and it, and it overflows? Yeah, yeah. Right, so again, the, global, the local depth is one, so I'll increase this lo local depth to two. So now for every single key I have in here, I'll look at the, uh, the first two bits, and that'll tell me where I need to go. So the, the, first, also, the first two bits will then get split up into two separate buckets. So everybody, everybody was pointing, everybody that starts with a zero points to this one here, right? Zero, 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 zero. So now I'll look at two bits. So I'll have a bucket for zero, zero, and a bucket for zero, one. Zero, 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 one. So there'll be two new buckets. The zero, zero guys will point to that one. The zero, one guys will point to the other one. And then I look at the, the two bits for all my keys, and that tells me which of the two I want to go into. So like, does that mean you still have to maintain a pointer from the bucket to the, the global slot? His, his question is, do I, do I still have to maintain a pointer from the bucket back to the global slot? Yeah. Why? No. So like, you know what, you, again, the local depth tells you who's pointing to you. But like when you're building this, you split the first bucket to two, like how do you know which pointer to point to? Because you know who's pointing to you based on your local depth. Okay. Right? The local depth is one. That means that anybody that has, uh, right, anybody that has zero yeah. in the first bit, because I can look at what's inside of me, it has to be pointing to me. Right? Okay, so like you're going back to the global hash table and find everybody uh, with a starting zero and we do the pointer? It's cheap, it's nothing. Okay. Yeah. Do we need to string the hash table? I mean, if we just uh, remove a lot of entries from the hash table, uh, a lot of uh, buckets here will be empty. So, so, yeah, so his question is, are you asking in the real world or asking for the project? His question is, do we have to shrink the hash table? Uh, in the real world. In the real world, yes. In the project, no. <laughs> we'll see in linear hashing, again, we have a little time. In linear hashing, it's actually really easy to do. It's actually not hard to do this either, right? You just have to recognize that, like, oh, well, if I go back from three, my global depth of three to two, will I, can I collapse the, everything and not have to uh, you know, reshuffle everything? It's more expensive to, to go deletion in this case than, than extending. Well, let's yeah, try to go around, yes. So this question is, if I have four entries to the same hash key, what do you do after you split? Like so, so, so we were here. Yeah. So, I think so. His question is: Say in this case here, I did. I'm, I'm going to. I have to split because I want to insert C because I want to put four elements and I I can only sort three. Let's say I split this again, and worst case scenario, it hashes again to the same thing all to the same bucket, which, which then overflows. You have to split again. If the whole hash key is the same, uh, then, then uh, if it's always going to be the same, then that's the worst case scenario. That means you have a terrible collision rate. Then you have to keep extending, extending this thing over here until it doesn't. This question is, do you not need to care about this in the project? Your, your page table is not going to be that big, right? So again, this is, you're storing, the number of bits is, could be up to 64 bits. The likelihood that a page ID in your project will map to, to the same value from 2 to 64 is, is unlikely, okay? All right, there's a bunch of other questions. I want to finish up and talk about uh, linear hashing uh, before we run out of time. Um, so linear hashing, I don't, actually don't know if it's in the textbook. Uh, this, this is another approach. I think it's kind of elegant. Again, same thing as from the 1980s, but a lot of systems use this. Um, we're going to do, again, we're going to do incremental splits, but we're going to, uh, instead of just splitting the, the exact bucket that overflowed, we're actually going to have a pointer that can say, what's the next bucket we want to split? And so what will happen is, every time we do a split, because uh, some other bucket overflowed, we split whatever we're pointing to, and then move, move the, the, the pointer down by one, and keep going until we reach the bottom, and then loop back around, and then split again. Right? So this is, this is even more incremental. 
So we'll define overflow in, in for our purposes here is just when the when we go from one bucket to two buckets. But in your actual implementation, it can mean a bunch of different things. Right? It can mean that the, the, the length of the chain has gotten too long on average for the entire system. Um, you have uh, low space utilization for some buckets, and you want to go in different directions. It doesn't matter, but for our purposes, we just assume that we uh, the we we just assume that it's whatever. Um, whenever you go from one bucket to two bucket, uh, the thing we're trying to solve here, and I think some of you guys brought this up in extendable hashing, is in extendable hashing. Every single time I did a split, I had to double the size of the of that directory of the slot array. In linear hashing, we don't have this problem. We don't have to do this because we're going to do this one at a time. All right, so say that again, we have four elements and we have four, four, uh, four, four buckets that we're pointing to. So the split pointer, again, is going to be a some page or some, sorry, some bucket we're going to split whenever we overflow. So for, for this also as well, it's going to look a lot like cuckoo hashing where we're going to have multiple hash functions. But instead of actually applying them at the same time, we only apply them uh, one at a time. And we don't need to go look at additional hash functions if the thing we hash to is below our split pointer. That'll make more sense in a, in a second. But as we extend the directory and add more hash functions, we always start off with the first hash function. And we may not need to go look at the other hash functions unless we are above the, the split pointer. All right, so let's say we want to do a find on 6. Again, simple hash function. We're just going to mod it by the number of slots we have. So 6 mod, uh, mod 4 goes to 2. So we go find our entry there, right? That just looks like chain hash table, no problem. Now we're going to do insert on 17. 17 uh, mod 4 it hashes to 1, so that goes here. But again, we can only store three entries, so we have, an, oh, we have to, to extend it by adding a, an additional bucket. Now this triggers our overflow, because we said every time we make a new bucket, that counts as an overflow. So now what will happen is, this, whatever the split pointer is pointing at, that's the bucket we're going to split. Not the one we just we just overflowed. And extendable hashing was always the one that overflowed. And split pointer in linear hashing is always the one that we're pointing to. So in this case here, the split pointer is pointing to uh, uh, position zero. So we're going to want to sp split this one at the top. So all we have to do is just add an additional location to our slot array, slot directory, and add a new hash function that's going to be based on. Uh, the number of keys times the, the, the key mod by the, 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 the double the number of keys we have in our slot array now. So we just had n elements. Now when we're going to do a mod, we're going to have mod 2n. But as we'll see in a second, nobody, although we haven't allocated 2n entries over here in the slot array, no one's actually going to ever get to there because you have to first always look at the hash function. And if you, the hash function, if you hash here and, and you're above the split pointer, then you look at the second one. And we know that we're never going to hit anything, uh, anything beyond what we've already allocated. So in this case here, we add 4. And then um, we split the first guy here. So it had 20 in it. Now 20 goes to the bottom. And we move the split pointer down by 1. So now let's say we want to do a lookup on 20. So we always start off with the first hash function, right? 20 mod 4, which is the number of elements we have initially, uh, equals 0. So that points to the slot array here at the top. But now we said that we know that 0 is above where the split pointer is. I sort of think of this, the split pointer as a threshold. Anything above that says, I not, after I've hashed the I've used the first hash function, I find I'm above where the split pointer is, then I have to use the sec second hash function. And then that will map me down, down below, and then I can find the entry that I'm looking for. Right? So every time I, I, there's an overflow, I do a split, and I move the split pointer down by one. If I hash the first hash function, I land to uh, above the split pointer, then I use, you have to use the second hash function to figure out where I really need to go. And the math works out that, again, you can never have anything mapped to a 5, 6, 7, 8, even though you haven't allocated those spaces yet. Because okay? any, anything that could get there would always land in, in the, below with the split pointer. Yes? What if you want to apply? He says, what if you want to find 13? So simple. I take the first hash function, 13 mod 4 would tell me that it's 1. 1 is below the split pointer, so I don't need to look at the second hash function. So I map right to the bucket and find what I want. If I want to do a lookup on 8, 8 mod, mod 4 will be 0. I know I'm above my, my split pointer, so I look at the second hash function. 8 mod 8 is 0, so there we go. It's right there. 
Yes? So does this work only for integer keys? This question is, does this only work for integer keys? Uh, no, because the hash function is going to return you back, ret always return you a, uh, uh, an integer, like 32 bit or 64 bits. I'm just showing integer keys to keep it really simple here. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's always going to be the same hash function. Uh, it's, but you're just going to mod it by, by a different number, right? So again, hash functions return a value from zero to two, you know two to the sixty-four. We always mod it by the number of slots we have to ground us where we need to go, right? With, within within the number of elements we have. At some point, the split point will reach the bottom. At that point, we we've extended it out to be double the size of the uh, the number of elements we started that originally. So then we delete the first hash hash key and reset the split pointer back at the top and start start over again. Yes? What is the one to insert 21? He says if you want to insert 21, so 21, uh, what is 21 mod 4? <coughs> 1, right? So you hash to 1, you land here, you, you, uh, this would be overflow, and you insert into there. Oh yeah, so yeah, for this in here, that would count actually, yeah, so his question is, would that count as a overflow Again, depends on how you implemented it. If you say it's only when you create a new bucket, then no, it wouldn't overflow. If you say that it's whenever you, you're, the thing you're pointing at uh, has an additional bucket, then yes, you would you that count as an overflow. Depends on the implementation. The math still works out correctly in both cases, though. Okay, so how do we determine when to split, uh, when to split a bucket so this question is, how do we determine when to split a bucket in linear hashing? It's whenever I run out of space. So the very beginning, right, I was here. I want to insert 17. It hashes to this bucket 1. The bucket already has three elements. I can't put another element in, so I, I have to overflow it. Right? And I said, it, globally, I said whenever a bucket uh, overflows, creates a new bucket in the, in the, in the chain, that triggers the split pointer to split whatever it's pointing at. So we end up then at this point here, we split the first one. Okay, so if we insert two more elements in the position one, it will count another overflow. Uh, another split. It depends on how it's implemented. If you say again, you can you can say whenever I create a new bucket, split. Or if the split pointer is pointing at a bucket that's already overflowed, then I split. So you could have it say, all right, I move my split pointer down here. This thing's already overflowed. So immediately go then split, split it and move it down again. Depends on the implementation. No one way is better than another. But so, so we have like two minutes left. Is it, is it a quick question or? What's a quick question? Uh, so what, what pointer points to 17? Yeah, yeah. This, this one does. It's, it's like in chain hashing. It's an overflow. It just says, I, if, it's like, if the thing you're looking for is not in this bucket, oh, by the way, here's a pointer to the next bucket you should go scan. And you have to scan the entire thing. OK. Uh, I think we covered most of this. Uh, the only thing I'll say also, too, about linear hashing, what's really nice about it is it's really easy to go in the other direction. Right? You could say, all right, well, whenever my bucket is, uh, is empty, then that's the same thing as a, uh, as, as a reverse. And I just go then do a reverse split on whatever the split pointer is pointing at from before and move it back up. All right? So you can do uh, addition and a retraction very easily, uh, much more easily than you can in, in some of the other schemes. All right. So just to, to finish up, I would say that uh, all the data structures we talked about here today uh, ideally will give you O1 lookups. Um, the constant factors actually matter, and it depends on your collision rate. You end up may having to do a sequential scan across all elements or all keys to find the thing you're looking for, right? But again, there's this trade-off between having uh, uh, very fast uh, lookups and insertions with the flexibility of not having to maybe rebuild everything every time you, you touch it. So I don't have time to do the demo. If, I mean, I'm, we can just keep going if people have to leave, but I can give a quick Postgres demo. Um, what I'll say is, again, that this is hash table is probably usually not what you're going to want to use for, for table indexes. Because they can only do single key lookups. Does something equal something? You can't do range scans, right? You can't have partial keys. You have to have all the key, because otherwise it's not going to hash the same thing. 
And the way we can, we can do better is having the, the order preserving indexes like in B plus tree. Okay? Any questions? So again, next class we're going to do uh, uh, B plus trees. So most of the time of that, we'll spend a little bit of time on skip lists and radix trees or tries. But B trees are really the, 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 the granddaddy of all the data structures. Okay? <laughs> okay. That's my favorite all time. <laughs> what is it? Yes. It's the S P Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dope. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cuff, so y'all my fool, cause I drink proof. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come, Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And faint eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the four. A six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Isaac's straight, so it really don't matter.